This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We're going to take a look at the chapter on audit planning, which is very significant in the AAA syllabus. In the chapter, they remind us about the audit process, remind us about the purpose of planning, the difference between the audit strategy and the audit plan, and then take us through the planning procedures into the very important area of risk of material misstatement and also remind us about materiality. I keep saying remind us because a lot of this would be familiar to you from studying AA or having been exempt from it for example, from doing a relevant degree. There's a lot more about audit risk in the next chapter, which again is covered in the next, um, in the next uh, lecture. So here we've got a reminder about the audit process. I don't want to read out every stage, but if you just look down the diagram that I'm showing to you, you can see what happens that right at the planning stage, we need to make sure that we understand the business, decide where the risks lie, we'll remind ourselves what risk means in a minute or two, and then decide on response. The traditional response is that if the controls are going to be effective, then you go down the left-hand side of this diagram, make sure the controls are working, and then you won't have to do as deep so many detailed work on the numbers as you would otherwise. If the controls are expected to be ineffective, well, you might have to do a lot more work yourself. In fact, these days, as larger audit firms are sometimes auditing larger clients, they are sometimes going down the right-hand side by choice because they're making much more increased use of computers and so because of the existence of something called audit data analytics it's actually possible to test a hundred percent of the numbers in some cases using the computer which means perhaps in the future controls testing will almost become a little bit redundant anyway two different approaches we'll remind ourselves about the different types of test a bit later. If we come across here, the initial thing is of course that you must make sure that you plan the audit in the same way as you'd want to plan a journey. You wouldn't just set out with your suitcase and wonder where you were going. At this level of exam, could you be asked what the purpose of planning is? Well possibly, and the way that they would examine that is that a new um, member of the audit team who's perhaps just joined the firm and doesn't understand anything comes to you like a child comes to their parent and says I understand there are these things called ISAs now or international standards on auditing now what do the ISAs say about the purpose of planning obviously it would be very embarrassing if you stood there like a fish opening and closing your mouth and saying, uh, well, I don't know. So you might want to make sure that you learn at least these subheadings as we look at this section here. So you can see what's the point of planning to make sure I focus on key areas within the financial statements. So if you're auditing a shop, then presumably inventory is a key area to look for potential problems so to think about where the risk lies cash at bank is not really high risk usually because the company knows how much cash it's got the bank knows how much it's got cash it's got so actually that may not be a problem however things like judgmental issues like depreciation and provisions we do need to think about in advance. Clearly, to make sure that we are as efficient as possible in doing the audit, 
because time is money, to make sure we've put the right people on the audit team. So someone who's very experienced training up some a couple of other people who are less experienced. A bit like when you look at the medical profession. Again, there'll always be that mixture, won't there? When you have to go to hospital to make sure that we can do coordination with internal audit or maybe we need the use of an auditor's expert. And above all, you stand there like the ringmistress or ringmaster at a circus, making sure that you supervise the audit team. Now, some people say they can, they will remember that, which is great. If you don't think you'll remember it, I'd certainly remember maybe four of those points. At the planning stage, the auditor has to focus on the preparation of two documents. One is the strategy and the other is the plan. Again, the audit junior might say to you, what's the difference between the strategy and the plan? And I expect you'd probably say, well, the strategy is the big picture and the plan is the detail. And then you would look again at the question and say, well, this seems to be for four marks. So I don't think I've got four marks and you haven't. So you need a bit more issue about what that big picture is and what that detail is. So when we talk about the strategy, the sorts of things that would be summarized, and I'm just assuming that we're looking at something like a shop or a chain of shops, what's the nature of the business? How do its systems work? Just broadly speaking, um, at what level shall I assess materiality? What are the key risks within that business from an audit perspective? So the key audit risk, <clears throat> um, what's my timetable? It's those kind of things in a document the plan is much, much more detailed and the plan will actually have details of the specific risks and the way in which we actually will solve them. So where you consider there's an issue in respect of inventory count, the audit plan will actually detail what those detailed procedures are. So attend the count, observe the instruct compliance with instructions, make seven counts from the floor to the records, seven counts from the records to the floor. So this is where you would see the detailed audit procedures. So there we are. There's strategy versus plan. At this stage, very much ensuring that we have an understanding of the entity. Again, they would never ask you to really write this big list out unless in the exam, which kind of simulates real life, an audit junior person said to you, well, what must I understand? Again, so you do need three or four of these up your sleeve. So on the assumption, let's say that you're looking at something like a transport company that runs the local buses so understanding again the entity and of course the industry so you understand effectively how that business works specific regulations and wherever it is there's bound to be a transport act telling them not to put more than 96 people on the bus for that reporting framework which for the sake of our exam is international financial reporting standards. Objectives of management, so whatever that happens to be, which inevitably will be to achieve a certain margin. But in addition, of course, these days to things like to preserve the environmental credentials again of the business. What are the things that would prevent us achieving or the client achieving those objectives? So financially, for example, what would happen if they couldn't pay for the lease of the buses that they probably rent? What would happen if they can't staff the buses because they pay the staff 
a fairly low wage. What will happen again if the bus driver gets on again having um, been on the, the beer or the wine or something and drives the bus into a lamppost? Understanding of the internal controls and the control environment. There's a bit more about that later and also in the later chapters. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. Understanding above all, really these other points go together. How do I management identify again business risks? And in particular, a lot of this comes back to monitoring performance and in particular, monitoring key performance indicators. So monitoring key performance indicators, um, as long as they are well set out and management keep an eye on them every month, well, what sorts of things do we mean? Financial key performance indicators, things like return on capital, gross profit margin, current ratio, all those ratios you're familiar with, and non-financial again. So number of passengers carried, um, fuel consumption. So uh, all of those sort of number of new bus routes taken on or lost to competitors. Again, if management are monitoring those every month, we do know that they have some control of the business, which gives us again, a better feel um, for what we must do when we come to audit in a minute. Just underneath, again, a reminder about some of the verbs that are attached to risk assessment. I'll be asking lots of questions, again, of management. And again, so as to how things work, particularly with a new client. Analytical procedures, <clears throat> more about it later in the notes, but remember, that is using your brain and ratios to identify unusual transactions and events. So if I know that in the, in the food retail industry, the gross profit margin is, say, 20%, and I turn up at a client and their gross profit margin is 60%, the client will probably say, well, we sell deluxe products, and that may be true, but more likely than not, that ratio is out of kilter because, you know, because there's an error in the financial statement. So again, identifying what does not seem right using our brain. Of course, observing what they do. So traditionally a factory tour again, and looking at all sorts of relevant documents, internal, external to fully understand the business. Now at that stage, again, very much looking at the controls that exist. There's a lot more um, about controls if you feel weak on this, if you look back in our audit and assurance notes. So again, you might um, think about looking back at those if you're weak, but essentially again, understanding how the controls are set together and whether they're actually operating. It's a two-stage process design of controls and are they working properly traditional control of cash as you know is a bank reconciliation so is there is it well designed design means well actually do they do it every month is it done by someone who's competent and again is it then reviewed by someone who's more senior the second stage is is that bank reconciliation working? So look at the last three or four bank reconciliations, see the signature of the person again who actually performed that thing um, and the signature of the person who reviewed it. So it's a two-stage process. Thinking about the inventory count, stage one, how do the count instructions look? Do they look comprehensive? Stage two, now let's see if the staff are actually obeying those instructions. But of course, the real crux of the audit is, of course, thinking about risk of material misstatement. 
So this is where we're looking, isn't it? It's the only thing the auditor is obsessed with is potential errors. And that really includes um, omissions as well, potential errors in the financial statements. Every day when the auditor gets up, they have, they have a wash down, they brush their teeth, they have their breakfast, and they say, don't they, to their family, today I'm off to audit, I'm looking at the statement of financial position, I'm looking at the profit and loss, and seeing if any of the numbers in that are materially wrong. And maybe their family say, well, what else do you do? And they say, nothing. That is my life. It's looking for things that are wrong, in the soft P or statement of financial position, the profit and loss, and of course, all the related notes. Now, in this section here, the wording has changed very slightly, so I think it's important you're familiar with the wording that you see here um, because of a, a recent revision of the, of the ISA. So let's just be careful with the wording here. So there's a risk of something being wrong in the financial statements. Think about how likely it is and think about the size of it. Just like any risk management, isn't it? How likely is it to go wrong and how big would the error be? And when we assess that risk, now this is something that we talk about more in the next lecture as well and the next chapter of the notes. Think about the risk at the financial statement level and the assertion level. Now, sometimes when you criticize someone's work, maybe you're just saying, well, this little thing here is wrong. Please correct it. That's like the assertion level. That is an individual problem with, for example, inventory, or perhaps there's an individual problem with revenue. And so it may be that when you're looking at a cash-based business, I am worried at the assertion level about, let's say, completeness of revenue. Again, if you've forgotten about the assertions, please look back to our AA notes to remind you about the names of them. Existence, completeness, rights and obligations, um, accuracy, words like that. There might be one thing wrong, or it could be, the whole set of accounts is wrong. And that's what they mean by errors at the financial statement level. And of course, these arise traditionally, for example, this is you know a little bit informal, but I'd say these would arise, for example, if the client is not a going concern. I don't mean there are uncertainties. I mean, it's just not a going concern. It's finished. In that case, the financial statements would be, have to be done on a completely different basis, known as a breakup basis. So everything is wrong. When we talk about everything being wrong or potentially wrong, another one for as an example would be where you think there's a chance that management might manipulate the financial statements. And in particular, that's the very important area of fraudulent financial reporting. Things like if there's a profit-related pay scheme, if the management are seeking a listing of the company, if there's pressure from the bank, there's then a chance that they will deliberately manipulate the financial statements, particularly with judgmental things like deciding how much revenue belongs in this year and next year, provisions for reorganizations, provisions for warranty claims, allowances for depreciation, allowances for impairment. Again, so it's all those sorts of things. So when we find out that there is big pressure on management, we start out by saying, well, there's risk at the financial statement level. I must look at multiple balances and transactions, not just individual ones. So assertion level is where there's a problem with single balances and transactions. Financial statement level is very much where everything might be wrong. 
And sometimes this, this financial statement level could be caused by, I'm just saying, well, very weak internal controls. You may have a, again, a family member who runs a little business and doesn't keep any, any records whatsoever. And you think, well, their accountant must have a nightmare. Um, you know, so there are just no records. Perhaps you have a friend who's like that. Now, here we can see these revised concepts and definitions in ISA 315. Don't forget, will you get marks for quoting the standard number? No, so don't. Because if you do, you might quote the wrong one and then no one knows where we're going. In particular, um, again, I want to just focus on this idea of the spectrum of inherent risk. We remind ourselves again about inherent risk in the next chapter. But inherent risk is the chance of an error before you start to think about the internal controls. The spectrum at the end of the day, it's like a dial on a meter. How significant is that risk? So coming back across over here, how likely is it to occur? How big is the potential error because of it? So this links up, doesn't it, to these words like likelihood. As with any risk management, what is the likelihood? And also potentially, what is the magnitude of the error that might occur? And in particular, the word that you should use in the exam is this significant risk. Significant risk is one which is right at the top end of the spectrum. And you can imagine the audit manager saying to her team, look team, we need to start with the significant risks. So essentially, by understanding the business, understanding what assertions are relevant, like completeness, understanding what transactions might be significant, like revenue, you can decide where you are on that spectrum and therefore, what risks are actually um, most significant and need the work? As I said before, you'll talk more about risk in the next chapter. Um, but you may well see that term in the exam, significant risk. So in particular, if you've got a three-page scenario where you can see there are all sorts of problems with the client, you know, is it the fact it's a new client, a significant risk? Probably not. That's quite low down on the pecking order. So if you notice they're not a going concern and it's a new client, the significant risk has to be, doesn't it, that they're not a going concern. So as always, it means look for those things that are large. Look for those things, again, that are most likely. Use that phrase, significant risk, something on the upper end of the spectrum of risk and to say more about risk itself in the next lecture. At the planning stage as well, the auditor needs to determine, of course, what is material. There's a reminder about the definition of material. Something whose omission or misstatement would influence the economic decisions of users and it could be something to do with being material by uh, size. In other words, the numbers. Or it could be material by nature. And the classics material by nature is things like director's transactions. Again, the relevant accounting standard for directors is related party. So it's probably better that you say related party transactions. Everyone knows, don't they, that um, if a politician spends public money, even if it's three pounds on a coffee, then that will be four hours of prime time coverage on the TV. And so anything the directors spend, again, the use of the accounts, they just want to know about it. You might say, well, it's like fish market gossip. Well, perhaps it is. But if that's what they want, that's what they're going to get. 
So related party or director's transactions, the classic example of transactions being material by nature. When we think about the number size, again, the usual benchmark is this one here, 5 to 10% of profit before tax. It's quite likely she will actually, um, you know, give us a profit figure in the question. If you're then able to say that a transaction is 8% of PBT and therefore potentially material, well then that actually will get you some credit. Um, often in practice, they might use 5% again if the business is quite well organized. So perhaps if it's lower um, risk in a sense, or, low, or better controls within the business, perhaps that would be a better word. So if they've got fairly good controls in the business, um, they might. let's say they might use, I'll start that sentence again. So if the client has good controls, no guarantee, it depends, it's judgment, isn't it? They might use 10% of PBT, profit before tax. If the client has got bad controls, they might use 5% of PBT. And that's the benchmark that they would use. Usually, that's what you would tend to compare things to, isn't it? When you're looking at scenario questions, sometimes we might use revenue and we would use revenue again. That would be used if, for example, profit is very low. If the profit is very low, you can't really use 10% of that very low figure. So if the profit or profit before tax is very low, then they might use, again, half or 1% of revenue. These figures, please, are not in the ISA. It's down to judgment. So students would say to me, what figure should I use? I usually say, well, 5% of profit, I'd say it's potentially material. That's a fairly safe benchmark. Sometimes, if, uh, if companies are very top heavy with assets, like they hold investment properties or investments, they might use, again, um, assets as a benchmark as well. So again, so these would be companies which are, so if the company, again, is, I'm going to call that asset heavy. Lots of investment properties, lots of PPE, lots of general investments, perhaps they might use assets as a benchmark. As it says in the notes here, it's all back to professional judgment. Let's imagine that the material, the profit was 100, and you set materiality at 5% of 100, 5% of 100 is 5. You then gathered the audit team to you and said, Team, materiality is five. And you then send the audit team out to do the work. So Belinda goes out to test revenue and Boris goes out to test PPE. And later they come back and I say, were there any material errors? And Belinda says, no, my errors were only four. And Boris says, no, my errors were only four. You're now going, aren't you? Four plus four is eight. I don't believe it. I've gone over the benchmark. So in that case, what we would do instead in practice is set something known as performance materiality. It's this definition down here. This is the one that is used for practical audit testing. It's a very, very long and mouthy definition, isn't it? But, um, and it's, it's hard looking at the definition to understand exactly what it means. But you'll notice here, um, if we look down here, it's something again, which would reduce the risk that the total errors, again, 
exceed financial statement maturity as a whole. As an example, but this again is not in the ISA, they might use something like somewhere between 50 and 75% of overall materiality. So if overall materiality is, let's just say, five, they might be saying, well, performance materiality is two and a half. It just means we're working on the safe side, again, when we come to understand how wrong this set of financial statements are. Well, there we are. So in this chapter, what have we actually looked at? We reminded ourselves in broad terms about the audit process. All of these points are picked up in later chapters. We remembered why we had to do audit planning, the difference between a strategy and a plan, um, what we need to understand about the business before we start work, how we do that, a reminder about where to look for more information about controls. Most significantly of all, this concept of the risk of material misstatement, the two levels it exists at, the accounts as a whole and individual balances and transactions. This new phrase, significant risk, that you must use in the exam, alongside the spectrum of risk, the spectrum of risk, and finally a reminder about setting materiality at the planning stage. That's it for audit planning.